So here's a continuation of our Excel topics. And today what we're going to go through are some different basics for formulas and bed mass, some different cell references, some introductory functions in math and statistical, just taking a look at some of the errors we get with formula errors and auditing, and then finally some specialized date things. So in our first sheet here in formulas, and you have this file on Canvas that you can download to work along with it. We're just going to enter some formulas using actual numbers. So remember to enter a formula, you have to press equals. And if I want to go five times six, I just go five times six. So notice the asterisk is the multiplication symbol and enter. If I want to do subtraction equals 17, take away five and we get 12. And we're entering the formulas here in yellow and we have the correct answer shown in gray. We can then go equal 16 divided by 4. And remember, the division symbol in Excel is the forward slash. Then we have equals 19 plus 3. And then we're going to get a little more complicated. So we have equals 18 divided by 9 minus 3. And this is where our bed mass rules are going to come into play. So remember, bed mass is brackets, exponents, division, multiplication, addition, and then subtraction. So the multiplication is going to happen first, the 18 divided by 9, and then we'll have 2, 2 minus 3, and we should get the answer, negative 1. Let's do the same calculation, but let's put brackets around the 9 minus 3. So this time we want the subtraction to occur first. So equals 18 divided, open our brackets, 9 take away 3, close our brackets, and we can see how we get 3 this time. Now for exponents, we're going to use the um, little sort of hat that's on top of our 6 key. So in order to get the exponents, we need our equal sign for the formula, 2. And we want to raise it to the power, so we go shift and the 6 key to get that little up arrow symbol. We're raising that to the fourth. We're then going to subtract 4 from it, and then we're going to multiply by 2. So again, bed mass will tell us that exponents happens before the multiplication and the subtraction. And we can get 8 for that. Let's again use some more bed mass. So let's have brackets, 2 rise to the fourth power. So remember to get that little arrow symbol, you need to go shift and the six key. We're going to subtract four from this, close our brackets, and then we'll multiply by three. Okay, so the brackets is going to happen first. And we get 36. So a different answer from the before, because we have brackets around the first two terms. Let's try this one, 16 plus four, divided by 5 plus 2 and then multiply by 10. And oops, obviously, what did I forget here? I forgot my equal symbol. Okay, so if I have a formula, if I want a calculation I want to do, don't forget your equal symbol. And we get the 36, 8. Let's do it again, same values, but with brackets around different items here. So equals open brackets 16 plus 4, close brackets, divide by 5, then add open brackets 2 times 10, and close brackets. And we get the answer 24. Let's do the same values again with different brackets this time. Now I'm going to have divided by and I want 5 plus 2 times 10. Okay, so we have nested brackets here. I have a term that's bracketed within another bracket. So equals open bracket 16 plus 4. Then I want to divide open brackets 5 plus open brackets again 2 times 10 close brackets, close brackets. And notice how, well, I'm just going to take away one of the brackets here. Notice how it's showing that these two red brackets are matching each other. And that's sort of a visual indicator that, you know, watch your brackets, maybe count. And I need to get the next one. Another way to do this is to, if, to ensure that you have the right number of brackets is that you could count the number of open brackets. So there's one, two, three, and then count the number of close brackets one, two, three, and those two should match. And we get the point eight. Let's try the last few here, equals 16 plus eight, and we're gonna subtract 10 
from this. So no brackets around it at all. We get 14. We're going to do it again with brackets equals 16 plus 8. Close our brackets, subtract 10. We still get 14. And then last but not least, 16 plus open brackets 8 minus 10, close brackets equals. These last three are this are an illustration of the distributive law of addition and subtraction. So it doesn't matter how we put the brackets around these three, <coughs> we'll always get the same answer. Let's move on to our cell reference tab here. So let's highlight the cell reference tabs. And we're going to have a couple of different types of cell references. If we actually, if we go back, oh no, we can't go back to that because we just had numbers. Um, so we'll take a look at the three different types of cell references that we have. We're going to have relative, absolute, and then mixed. So relative cell references, it means that the row or the column reference could change. An example we have here is a cell reference A5. Okay, There's no special symbol before each of these, so everything's going to move as we move the formula. I have an illustration here for the number of payments per year, maybe for a mortgage, our PMI rate 0.3% and our down payment rate 15%. We then have a house cost, the down payment calculation and the amount being financed. And we have the formula showing for the amount financed formula. So here, the amount financed, if I take a look at this particular cell and click up here in the formula bar, you can see that it's just cell E11 minus F11. So the 300,000 minus the 45,000. Just gonna escape out of that. And that equals 255,000. Over here is an actual formula in Excel. It's a function and it's the formula text function. So I've just entered equals formula text and I've referenced this particular cell G11 to show us what formula is being shown there. This is a nice way to see what the different cell references are. So we have E11 and F11. And these are considered relative cell references. Both the column and the row could change. Now if we copy this formula down, so we can just double click that. So now we can click on each of the individual cells themselves. We can see now the calculation there is E12 minus F12. And if I go to the next one in G13, well, that's E13 minus F13. So these are considered relative cell references because the E, column E, is staying the same. The row is changing from 11 to 12 to 13. And then column F is staying the same, but changing to 11, 12, and 13. And if I actually copy this formula, so let's take it here, I can go control C. And if I come up here and try and put it in J4 and go control V, I wind up getting nothing. Why is that? We'll take a look at the reference here. H4 minus I4. So what it did was it took the references relative to where my active cell is located. So let's come back here. This particular cell referenced column E, so two columns over, same row. And then one column over, same row. If I come up here where I copied my formula, again, it's referencing same row, two columns over, same row, one column over. But it's not yielding a result, obviously, because there's nothing there to calculate. Okay, So we're just going to clear that. We'll clear all. So when we're checking our formulas, either via the formula bar or using the formula text function, we can notice that we have relative cell references when there's no special symbol, in other words, no dollar sign around things. Now, the next type of cell reference we have is something called an absolute cell reference. An absolute, first off, means that we are going to see the dollar symbol, dollar sign symbol before the column heading and the row reference. And this means that we don't want that cell to change ever. We always want to refer to that cell and only that cell. So using the same type of information here, here I'm going to calculate my down payment. So I'm going to actually delete these. 
and reproduce them. So here I'm going to go equals. So my down payment is going to equal to my house cost. And then I'm going to multiply it by this cell here, C23, my down payment rate. Currently, C23 is a relative reference. If I want to make it an absolute cell reference, I need those two dollar signs. And how do I do that? There's two different ways depending on your keyboard. You might just have an F4 on your keyboard or if you have a laptop, typically what you have to do is use the little FN then F4. So on my ta tablet, I'm going to go FN F4. So I hold down the FN key, click on F4 and it puts dollar signs around it. If I try it again, hold the FN key down and F4. Now a dollar sign only goes with the row. If I do it again, FN F4. Now the dollar sign is only with the column reference. And if I do it one last time, FN F4, it brings me to the relative cell references again. Now I want absolute. I want the dollar sign before both the column and the row reference. So I'm going to hit FN F4. Now I have both of them and I'll press enter. So here we can see that the E21 in my formula is a relative cell reference. The dollar sign C dollar sign 23, that's an absolute cell reference. We can see what happens when we copy the formula down. So double clicking, see how the relative reference changes, still refers to column E, but the row is changed to 21, 22 and 23. But now here, each formula is always referring to that C23. So if I click here, I can see that it's referring to this one. If I click in the next example, again, it's always referring to this C23 reference, the 15%. And the same thing for the last one. So it's handy to use absolute cell references when we want to do a calculation, maybe in multiple places, but one of the terms is always going to be a single particular cell. All right, let's take a look at our last type of reference. It's called a mixed cell reference. And here we have two examples here. I have a dollar sign in front of the A, but nothing in front of the row five. So this is mixed because one is absolute, the column reference, and one is relative, the row reference. Alternatively, I could have column A and dollar sign column row five. The column A would be relative and the row five would be absolute. So let's try and use it for the same type of calculation for the down payment formula. I'm going to come here and show what we've done. So up into the formula bar, you can see that it's the house cost, 300,000 times the down payment rate, 15%. Okay. But notice how the 15% is in C33 and here now we have column C is relative, row 33 is static, row 33 doesn't change. Okay. Let's come down here and let's actually enter the, fun the formula. So equals the house cost times the down payment rate in C33 and remember right now it's relative column, relative row. I want to make sure it doesn't change that row. We'll leave the column alone and see what happens. So remember I can go FN F4. Now I have both our absolute so that cell will never change. FN F4. Now column C could change but the row will always stay the same and then FN F4 again. The column wouldn't change, but the row will. I'm going to go back to where we have that the column can change, but not the row. And now I'm just going to go equals. And here I just want to copy that formula down so that we can see again the row changed for the E, the house cost. The column C did not change. Sorry, the column C could change. It didn't but it did not change for the row. So we get the correct answer. And then again, if I copy this formula down, we see the same thing. Now we're referring to each of the different house costs, but we're always referring to that cell, okay? You'll find that sometimes you'll want completely absolute, both the column and the row, 
do not change. And sometimes other other instances you'll see that, well, I can keep one not changing and leave the other one that could change. To illustrate that, we're going to try something else. So let's take a look at changing this mixed cell reference instead of from C$33, where the column could change, but the row stays static, we're going to reverse it. So I'm going to copy my same information here. So I'm going to recalculate my down payment. I'm going to go equals the house cost. We're going to leave that as relative and we're going to multiply it by the down payment rate and I'll go FN F4. I don't want them both absolute. FN F4. I don't want the row to change. FN F4. So now the column will stay the same. I'll stay in column C, but my row will change. And we wind up getting the same answer. Just watch for a minute though. I'm just going to copy my formula here and then copy it down here for when we do something. We're going to now copy this formula down and see what happens. And notice how now we don't have any down payments for the $250,000 house or the $200,000 house. Why is that? Well, if we look at the formula again, click on the formula bar so you can see which cells are been highlighted. There's the $300,000 and the 15%. I go to the next one, click on the cells. Notice how, yes, it referred to the correct house cost, so that I wanted to change. But now because I said, we'll stay in column C, but change the row, well, now it's moved it to the row below. And that's why we get blank. And then the same thing for the next one. So this is something that you have to be aware of and be careful and watch for when you might want to use fully absolute so neither the column nor the row reference can change or whether you want to use mixed references where one of the two are is going to be allowed to be changed. There are ramifications for both ways so just watch out for that and I know in your simulation exam and the simulation training for this chapter two you have some different um, functions that you're using that have these different cell references. Also, um, in your assignment, it's your mid-level assignment for chapter two. Um, there is a, there are some required steps that want you to use the different types of cell references. Now, they don't always specifically tell you which ones to use. So please make sure for that assignment. So that's the mid-level exercise, chapter two. It's payroll for a zoo, I believe it is. Make sure that you are using cell references and doing your calculations, all right? One of the things we have to do in Excel is that we have to try to, you know, one of its purposes is to make things more efficient. And one of the ways that we can make things more efficient is using the different types of cell references. All right, let's move on to our mathematics and statistical functions. So again, we're going to use now some predefined functions in Excel. We're going to look at different ways to get to them. And again, I have the answers here. I have the data set that we're going to analyze underscores, and we can put in our formula text. So let's take a look at some different things we want to do. So for cell F7, we want to enter a function that calculates the total of all the scores. Now with functions, there are different ways that we can access them. And if we're on our home tab, one of the ways we can access it is through this auto sum icon. And in the auto sum, if we use the down arrow, we have some different functions that are available right from this home tab. Sum, average, count, max, min, and we could go even into more. Okay. We could also go into formulas. And we could say, OK, I just want to look up some formulas. And I will want to look up math and trig formulas. And I can come here, and then I see a whole big long list of different things I might want to do. And we can see that sum is also here. Another way we can do it is to use the insert function here on our right beside our formula bar. So there's the insert function. Or again, on the formula tab, we can use the insert function. Okay. So I'm going to use a couple of different ways to do these for the different calculations we're doing. 
So since the first one we want is just a total of all the scores, I'm going to use auto sum. And when we click on auto sum, we can see that it's saying, okay, well, it looks like you want the auto sum of this, all right? It usually tries to pick a cell reference close to where you are. That's not what I want to sum. I want to now go in and highlight these cells from B7 to B19. And see, now we have the reference B7 to B19. And I can go equals, and I've got my correct answer. I can check my formula text. This is another way you could actually get a function. You can press the equal symbol and you can start typing it in. So formula. So there's my formula text and I want to get the formula text for this cell over here. So there's my sum function B7 to B19. Okay, That's one way to enter it. Here we can go average. So we have average here. So I can come up here and pick average or I can go to formulas and go, well, average is going to be a statistical function. So that's under statistics. And then I can pick it or I can actually start going equals and just start spelling it. And I get a little drop down list, okay? Alternatively, let's escape out of there for a minute. I can come into the insert function again. So either through the formulas and right on the ribbon or over here and we get a little dialog box or a window that allows us to search and here um, I'm just going to search for some right now okay and go go and it'll find it for me okay so if you're not sure which one it is like what category it falls under you can just use the insert function the either on the ribbon or beside the formula bar and you can search for it. You usually um, get a little bit more comfortable with things and then you start realizing, oh, I can just start typing stuff in that sounds like what I want. That's usually a handy way. So equals average. There are different types of average. We just want the first one. As we sort of choose each of them, it gives us a little description so we can have sort of a, a guideline for or understanding of what that particular function does. We just want the arithmetic average. So I'm going to double click to select it. Now again, I can just go in and highlight my desired cells. Something else that's very important with functions is if we now have a chosen function and we go insert function, it comes up with the argument window. And the arguments are just, well, what are the things that are needed to run this function. So here I could actually type in individual numbers but here so the average tells you what it's going to do and number one is the arguments you want to average. So here I'm selected in the number one box and I can just come and select my B7 to B19. So notice you can put it in the argument box or you can just highlight and select as you're entering things. Okay and we can go okay. And again, I'll just bring that formula text down so we see the functions showing up right beside it. Let's try this one. It's a median score. Now, again, if you didn't know what category it fell under, you could come to home and check for auto sum, and there's nothing there. We could come to more functions and go, okay, I don't know where it is, but it sounds like median. Type it in and go, go, and there it shows up immediately double click it, we get the argument window again, and we can just highlight our desired cells and click OK. And now we have the median. Let's go for the low. Again, we can go auto sum. Low is going to be our minimum, so we can pick minimum. Now notice again when I, I do that type of selection, it's sort of giving me a, this is, are these the numbers you want to analyze? No, that's not. I just overwrite it by highlighting and select what I do desire. Do you notice that there is some information below when you start the function? There's the name of the function in blue underlined. There's the arguments. And here, remember the function window, the argument window had them all listed individually, but it's just showing it this way. If I come back to the argument window, you can see B7 to B19 shows up in both spots. Something else that is handy with this function argument window is that there is help on the function. 
So if you click on the help, it'll bring you out to the support in office and it'll help walk you through. Okay, I'm just going to come back to my particular spreadsheet and I'll go OK. And we have the minimum function. Now for the high score, well, that's going to be a maximum. So max, largest value. I'm going to double click to select it. And I'm going to highlight my desired cells. OK, so we get 98. Now these ones here, the next few, are going to be counting different things. And the first thing that we want to do is count the number of cells that have numbers in them. So if we look at our data set, it's very small. And all but two, one has NA and one is blank. So all but two of them have numbers in them. So let's see if we can sort that out. So we're going to go equals and we're going to go count. We have a number of different count functions. Count the number of cells in a range that contains numbers. So that's the one I want. So count A, highlight the cells, and enter. And there are indeed 11. Here's 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 cells in my scores area have numbers in them. And there's the function count. Now, if I want to count the number of cells that have nothing in them, so that are blank, again, I'm counting something, so I can start typing in count. And we'll count A, so count the number of cells in the range that are not empty. And I want to count the number that have nothing in them, so that are blank. Count blank counts the number of empty cells in a specified range. So I'm going to want count blank. And we're going to highlight our range. And we should get one because there's only one blank cell. Now here, we want to count the number of cells that have something in them. It could be text or it could be a number. So remember in the count function, we were counting the number of numeric cells, how many cells had numbers in them. This is now saying, well, I don't care what's in the cell. I just don't want it to be blank. So we're going to go equals count. And here, well, we don't want to count the ones that have numbers. Count A, oh, count the number of cells in a range that are not empty. OK, so let's pick count A, select our range, enter. And now we have 12 that are not empty. So we have this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 cells are not empty. They have something in them. <coughs> Let's take a look at this next one. We want the number of cells that contain a particular text string. Here we can use, so we want the, we, use, we can use accounting, but with if beside it. So again, we're still counting, but we're counting here. Count the number of cells within a range that meet a given condition. So let's pick count if, and let's bring up our argument window. So what's the range? We want to highlight our B7 to B19 again. And what's our criteria? Well, I want it to contain NA. OK. And I'm going to go OK. And it counted just one. Now, I don't know if you noticed. So I'm going to undo. And then I'm going to do it again. Equals count if. And when I bring up my argument window, so my range, no problem. But for my criteria, I just went N slash A, both in capitals. OK, notice nothing around it. And I go OK. Well, notice Excel actually put double quotes around the NA. So it's saying that this is actually text. And if I go back into my insert function argument window, it put it around for me. OK, so we can see down here, it has the double quotes around the NA. It, Excel put them in there for me. I can type them manually, or I can just type in my text. Excel will identify it or recognize it as such. All right, let's take a look at rounding. So we're going to go equals round. And I just want to round the average score that we calculated up here. 
again, we're going to go to the argument window and say, okay, well, I've got my value. How many digits do I round, want to round it to? And I'm just going to pick two. Okay. And notice here again, in your function argument window, it will tell you what was in your chosen cell, F8. So there's the value. It shows you what was in your next sort of uh, argument cell. So there's the two. And here, just below it, it actually shows the result. So we can go OK. And we have 8164. So I'm just going to come back to here. And I'm going to go through each of these and show you. There's the argument range. There's the result. There's the argument range. There's the result. So sometimes when you're having difficulties with functions, you know, you're able to see it right within that argument window. Let's do the same thing, calculate a rounded average score. And this time we're going to use a nested function. So let's just recap for a second. Our average score was 81.636363, etc. And here it's rounded to two decimal places. So the six, the first six three gets rounded up to six four. So that was a two step process. I had to calculate the average and then I had to round it. Well, we can actually do something called nesting functions. And that means put a function within a function. And there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, one of my favorite ways is to say, okay, well, I wanna get the average of something. So I'm gonna go equals average. Okay, and I highlight my reference and I go, okay. It's like, oh, wait a minute. I also wanted that to be rounded. So I can come back to my cell, come up to my formula bar, put my cursor right after the equal symbol and start typing in round. And oh yeah, I want the round function. And now I have round the average. And then I can come over here. So it says, give me your number. So that's gonna be the number. And then it says, well, how many digits do you want? And notice how I, when I was, didn't have the comma there, it highlighted number and it's saying that this is going to be my number. As soon as I put my comma in, it's prompting me, well, how many digits? And here I'm going to put two again and I'll close my brackets. And now I have the calculation all in one. I calculated the average and then I rounded that average to two decimal places. Okay, so that's example of a nested function. Something that you'll see in chapter six in the simulation training and simulation exam for that one little section for this chapter is something called a named reference. Now you saw when I was doing each of these functions, I had to come and highlight that range of cells. If I wanna do it maybe a little more easily, I can actually highlight the range of cells and I can define a name for it. So I've highlighted the range. I'm going to go into my formulas tab and I'm going to define a name for that range of cells. And I'm going to call it, we'll just call it scores. Okay. And we don't have to worry about anything else. It's in my workbook. I could put comments in if I wanted to. It does refer to this particular sheet that I'm in and the range of cells being referenced. And I just go Okay. Now when we have the defined name, we've activated something called a name manager. So we can see here, <coughs> there's my scores. These are all the different values that are listed in it. It's referring to this particular sheet and the scope is for the workbook. So you can close that out. I can use it in a formula and I've actually got two different things I can use, something called paste names, or we're just gonna look at scores for now. So I could come down here and go, okay, calculate the average again. So equals average, double click my average. And here I can start typing S-C-O-R-E and notice how my data set comes up now. So before these were functions, right? So you can see this is a function, average, etc. But as soon as I've picked it and given an open brackets, now it's waiting for the arguments and I can type, type, can start typing in my named ranges. So there's my scores and see how it's highlighted this section now. So I'm going to come out for a second. Nothing's there. As soon as I start typing scores and then select it 
So I double click to select it. Then it's automatically showing me, yep, you called this range of values scores. And then I can just close my brackets and I'm done. Okay. So named ranges are just another way that you can do things a little more efficiently in Excel. Let's take a look at one last thing. We can actually do calculations with data that's not on our current or active worksheet. So down here, this is the actual real answer. I want to calculate the average house cost for the home costs on the cell reference sheet. So we're going to come here and we're going to go average. Okay, so I want the average, but now notice what I'm doing. I'm going to go over to my cell reference. So that's the sheet where it said it was. And I'm just going to highlight the three house costs. Notice up in the formula bar, we have the average function. Cell ref is the name of the sheet that I'm in currently showing here. And these are the cells that I want to choose. I can then close my brackets, press enter. And now I'm back in the math and statistical functions sheet. And I've got my answer. And let's actually copy these so we can see our different functions. Okay, so there's our average of the cell reference sheet, these cells. So you can actually do calculations on data in different sheets. You're not restricted to just the sheet that you have as the active one. You could also do that if you had another workbook. If you do do it with another workbook though, whenever you do further calculations, those two workbooks have to be in the same um, folder though. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So that's our math and statistical functions. Let's take a look at different formulas for errors and auditing. Now we're not actually going to do this as part of our course, but it's handy to know what different errors come up, what they mean. So if you have a hashtag with an NA, it means that the formula can't find something. Okay, if you have hashtag value, it's that you're trying to use a word in a mathematical formula. Hashtag reference is that, well, there, there's some reference, there's a cell reference that was deleted. Okay, hashtag div slash zero means that you're trying to divide a number by zero, which you can't do mathematically, right? Hashtag number exclamation point means that there's a number being referred, referenced, has some symbols in it, so it's not really a number. And this is one of those things that Excel can autocorrect, it will fix it for us automatically. Hashtag name question mark is we're naming a where we've tried to access a function we're naming it incorrectly. Um, hashtag null with the exclamation point means that our functions arguments are missing a comma. And circular well that's when a formula or function tries to reference itself. Now there is error checking on the formula tab in the formula auditing grouping. But again, that's a somewhat more uh, intermediate topic. It's not part of our curriculum, but you may find in the future that we you will use this. We could use the show formulas. So let's just do an example here. Actually, let's come back to the mathematical and statistics. And let's stay in the formulas tab and go show formulas. And I had shown you how to do this before with a shortcut key but this is the menu way. So you can see here that now we're seeing the formulas in the actual calculation. I take it away and I've got my values back. Remember last time I had shown you guys how to use the control and the grab key to do the exact same thing. Okay, so that was a shortcut key, control and grab. Let's come back to our formulas and auditing. So this is just a little bit of an explanation for some of the stuff that happens in this formula auditing grouping. As I said, we're not going to be involved in that for our course. Let's take a look at our very last item, our last sheet on dates. So there's a couple of specialized date functions today and now that give us different date information that we might be interested in. These are actually called no argument functions because there's nothing inside the brackets. So if I come to D8 and I go equals today and I just press enter, okay, it's saying, well, it looks like I did something wrong here. 
Well, I used today. What am I missing? I'm missing the open bracket and the close bracket. Notice as soon as I put the open bracket there, it's saying, oh, that's the function you wanted. And I could just pick it. And maybe it's saying that, well, okay, it looks like you don't know what you're doing. So here's some help on it. Okay, so Excel sometimes will automatically help us. I don't need an argument in there. I can just go close brackets and it's coming up with January 17th, 2021. There's a shortcut key for this today function. It does not update when the workbook reopens. So here I can just go control and the semicolon key. And again, I'll get the same answer. The difference between using the today function and using the shortcut is that if I use the today function, every time my workbook opens, it will update it. Okay, so say I had the same um, workbook and I open it up tomorrow, I come to this sheet, it's going to change it to the 18th. If I use the control semicolon though, it will not update it. Okay, let's try another one equals now. And again, this is a no argument one, so we need the open and close quotes. And we now we have the date and the time. Okay, and this one updates today's date and time on a 24 hour clock. So 1423, it's 223 right now. And it will update each time my workbook is opened, not while it's open, only if I close it and reopen it. You can also, if you have these types of date functions and you want them to, to be updating immediately, you can use the F9 key or the calculate now in our formulas tab. So here's our formulas tab, we're up here and here's the, in our last grouping of calculations, calculate now. So let's see if anything will update. If I go calculate now, oh, it's 1424 now, <laughs> all right? You're not seeing the date change because I haven't closed and opened it, okay? So a couple of little sort of specialized date functions. Another handy feature that Excel can give us is for calculating the number of days between two dates. So for example, I've given some instructions here, put in June 1st, 2019. And notice the default formatting in Excel is day, month, year, shown with two, two digits, three symbols, or three letters, I should say, and two digits. And here I'll go June 22nd, 2019. So again, day, month, year. And if I have those two dates, I can quickly calculate the number of days between them by using the days function. So equal days, that's the function I want. Let's bring the argument window up so we get more experience at that. What's the end date? Well, the end date is going to be the later date, so the June 22nd. What's the start date? That'll be the earlier date, June 1st. And the number of days between those two dates is 21 days. Okay, so just a little days between dates function. I know that you'll be using that in your, um, you should have used it last semester in your first semester math, and you'll definitely be using it in your second semester math, but typically you use it on your Texas BA2 plus calculator. Now with dates, we have to understand that there's formatting issues, okay? And some of us have seen some of these formatting issues in our mid-level and capstone exercises for chapter one. Okay, so let's review. So I'm gonna put in here, June 1st, 2019. And again, just showing you the, the uh, default format, day, month, year. And I had did, done one on a previous day for this spreadsheet, day, month, year. Now over here on the right hand side, I have a couple of different formats showing that if we use English Canada, if I have a general format, it yields a number. A short date will yield it like this. So year, month, day. Long date spells out the month, symbols or numbers for the day, numbers for the years. And then we can pick one from the list and we're going to see what I mean by that, or we can create custom one. So here, let's go back to our home tab. And this is where we have our number formatting. So I'm going to click in this cell here. 
and I've just referenced D40. Okay, so the June 1st, 2019. Okay, and it's general format that we have here. General format, the code in Excel for June 1st, 2019 is the number 43617. I can come up here and change this and change it to a date. And now it's showing June 1st, 2019. I'm just going to undo that so we can see how it stays as just a number. Short date. Well, that's again from this drop down. We have these two options here. And in one of our class recordings from last week, you should have seen that sometimes we'll see short date and sometimes we'll see long date, like the actual words showing up here. And it's a little quirk of Excel that happens with this. Okay. We have a long date, as I said, is typically month in words, the day and the year in numbers. And we have here just one picked from our list. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to come to um, the one from the list. I'm going to come up to my values here in my number area on my home tab and I'm going to go to more number formats. And we're going to drag this over to the side and see how we have different formattings available for date. Okay, So I can cursor down and pick one which one I like. Notice also that we can pick a location for our dates and I currently have picked for these cells English Canada. So if I pick one from the list let's pick this bottom one here 14 March 12. I go OK and now it's changed it day, month, year. Okay. On the custom one, again, I can come here, more number formats uh, in the custom area, and maybe I want to change it that the day is only three, tech, three letters, and then the month is three letters, and then we have the number for the day. Okay, so and let's leave that there, and then the year Y, 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 Y. Okay, and I go OK. So notice how now. The day has gone to three letters. The month is a three letter abbreviation. So Saturday, June 1st, 2019. Okay. And these were all under our either date with English Canada or under custom. Now over here, I've got using English US. So let's come over here and we'll go to the more number formats again and we'll come to Oops, I have to get off this one. I need to be on an actual date one. That's a general one. Again, that doesn't change. So <coughs> number more number formats, date, and here changing it to English. And we have different options. And English United States. And notice how my selections up here changed. If I change this to English Singapore, I get a different list. If I get it to Trinidad and Tobago, I get a different list. So I'm going to just going to come back to back to United States and go OK. And now I'm going to come here. And here again, see, I'm not seeing short or long date. OK, this looks like long date, but is long date with the month written out or not? Um, the one I showed you when we were in class. And the class recording, it showed long date and short date. Just recognize that, you know, things can be a little strange with software, right? We just have to get used to it. Okay. Here, so again, I'm referring to D40. And let's come to date. And let's say that this is the long date. Well, it looks like the short date above. And this is the frustrating aspect of Excel, is that, you know what? It doesn't always seem to be consistent. Just be aware of different settings in your software. Try and keep them always the same. Like, you know, you really should have maybe default English Canada if you don't already. Maybe somebody else was using comp your computer and they changed it. Okay, so these are the types of things that can happen. Let's take a look at another custom date here. So we'll go more number formats. We're in custom. And let's switch the order here. So we're going to take the double day. So we'll take that out. So we're going to go day, 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 comma, DD for the days is the num numerals. 
then we'll keep the months the way it are, the way it is, I should say. And we'll get rid of the comma. And we have a sample up top. So Saturday, the 1st of June, 2019. And we can see how that's changed now. So let's do the same thing down here. So you can try things out a little bit. So let's go equals and we'll put D4 and we'll make it an absolute cell reference. Okay, so column doesn't change, row doesn't change and enter. And I'm just gonna copy that down. Notice they're all the same. And I'm gonna change this format. It's a date, Excel recognizes it's a date, but I'm going to change it now to general. I'm also going to come in here and go back to my more number formats and under date, I'm going to make sure I'm picking Canada. Okay. So we'll just leave it there and I'll have to return that to general so we don't mess things up. Okay, let's try and come here and go to short date. Oh my heavens, now short date is showing up and now long date is showing up. So I just wanted to show you this, that, you know, if you have pre-existing formatting from somebody else, things might look different in this drop down list. Okay, I want short date. Let's put it that way. Year, month, day. Let's go long date. There's my long date. Write out the actual month, June 1st, June in words. Let's come down here and pick one from our list. So more number formats, we're in our date, and let's just do the M12, whatever that means. Ooh, I've got United States here, so I'm gonna switch that. I want Canada. So things to pay attention to. Notice how I got the different list again. And let's, let's pick something different. Let's pick this one below. And we'll go, okay. So the 1st of June, 19. And then let's just for fun create a custom one. So more number formats, custom. And let's do something completely different here. Again, you'll see under the custom list, it'll have some different options that maybe you have used before. But if you don't like any of them, you can just delete it. And we can say, okay, I want day, 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 meaning I want the word spelled out. So you can see the word shows up here, space, DD with the number and maybe I don't like the 01 in front of it so maybe I just want one digit for the day space so it's the Saturday the first we want the month MMMM -M -M -M. so it's going to spell out the whole month and then we're going to put a comma space and year 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 so we're going to have Saturday, the 1st of June, 2019. And again, I can change the order. Maybe I prefer doing it like this. DDDD, MMMM, space, single D, and year, 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 year. And I go, okay, Saturday, June 1st, 2019. And let's change this to June 22nd, 2019. Just in case you were thinking, well, I only had one digit for the day. Is it going to show up if I have two? Yes, it will. Okay, so don't worry about that. So that's a review or an overview, I should say, of basic formulas, cell references, statistical and math functions with cell references, some named ranges in there, and then just a brief overview of formulas, errors, and auditing, and then some information about dates and some specialized functions in dates.